It's actually a, uh, a specific built time of flight instrument by Scott Tanner, who got together some colleagues and formed something called DBS Sciences in, uh, in Canada. They have since been bought by a larger company called Fluidime, which is probably great for them and made them multimillionaires over again. And it is based on the indirect determination of biomolecules by labeling biomolecules with metals. And in his case, he uses a special kit that their company has designed, multi-atom element tags, which are connected to antibodies, which would then have very specific attachment to marker bio, uh, biomolecules in cells. And he has up to 34 different elemental tags that he can use to characterize up to 34 different biomolecules. In contrast to this, Standard fluorescence flow cytometry is limited to about 10 channels because of the spectral separation of the fluorescence signals. Up to 3,000 cells per second can be fed into this ICP and information brought out. This is a truly revolutionary approach. In a complementary fashion, and I'll show the connection in a moment, Detlef Günther in his laboratory at ETH, ETH Zurich has been investigating laser ablation for many years. And one of the problems with laser ablation is the sample is placed in a cell, it's laser ablated, and then the aerosol is conducted to the ICP. The problem is the cell has a finite geometry and internal volume. And it takes a long time after the first laser, after any laser ablation event, it takes a long time for these small particles which are ablated to escape the cell until the cell becomes clean again for the next shot. With this particular design, they were able to demonstrate that this cell was completely cleaned within 30 milliseconds of the laser ablation event, all the way down to only one second residual uh, mass fraction of aerosol. This allowed separated laser ablation repetition rates on the order of 20 to 30 hertz, uh, with, of course, one micron or less than one micron resolution at the focal point here, and for the first time, individual cells could be rapidly interrogated. Well, obviously, if we combine the CYTOF time of flight spectrometer with those 34 potential biomarkers with laser ablation in a cell that can rapidly interrogate and map a cell, then we have this situation here. Previously, only suspensions of cells were used, but now individual cell subpopulations and cell-cell interactions are possible to be studied using high resolution laser ablation in a low dispersion chamber and coupled with these 32 uh, elemental markers, we can look up to 32 proteins can be imaged across a cell. And this was sufficiently important. Unfortunately, we're missing the reference up here. This was published in Nature. And it, I think, is, is truly revolutionary. It will provide a means of looking at cancer, for example. I think these were tissues of breast cancer that were examined at this time. <clears throat> okay. The various platforms in ICPMS, we've looked at radio frequency platforms, which are characterized by quadrupoles for mass filters. We've looked at electrostatic and magnetic dispersion, which are characteristic of sector fields. We've looked at velocity-based separation of ions, which is time of flight. There is a new paradigm in ICPMS now, introduced by Chris Enke and it's called distance of flight mass spectrometry. Distance of flight mass spec accelerates all the ions to a m over z dependent velocity, allows them to drift in free space, and separates them, again, based on their uh, charge to mass ratio. But at some point in this conventional TOF, these ions will be separated. In a conventional time of flight mass spectrometer, we measure the arrival time of each of these ion packets. In a distance of flight, we take advantage of them being spatially separated and apply uh, a, an orthogonal voltage pulse which removes them from this flight and transfers them onto a detector. And the detector of choice is Gary's focal plane camera. So we have um, a physical detector here that can be placed along the flight path anywhere and then with a suitable uh, voltage pulse, it pushes these ions onto this multi-channel detector. And with that, you can 
um, integrate these signals. You can acquire very fast spectra. And it makes it easier than a time of flight system based on the dispersion in time. So time of flight disperses the ions in time. Distance of flight takes advantage of their dispersion in space. The requirements for distance of flight mass spec electronics are tremendously relaxed. We no longer have to worry about detectors recovering in nanosecond time periods. We no longer have to worry about two ions arriving at the same time and not being able to discriminate between them because it's a single pulse. But if two ions arrive at the same time on a Faraday strip, their charge is integrated. And of course, it's doubled. So all you need is a spatial selectivity. You have a simple design, unlimited mass range, just like a TOF, thousands of spectra per second, no fast resolution detectors, no pulse pileup, et cetera, et cetera. Truly simultaneous detection. I think it's potentially revolutionary, but how far the revolution will go remains to be seen. That's all I want to say about instrumentation developments or milestones in the last three decades. We have two minutes to cover the remaining. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're looking at like sample preparation. Sample preparation is the most important aspect of, an, of analysis. Most of the errors occur in sample preparation, followed by human error, et cetera. OK, very important. Over the years, sample preparation has changed dramatically from a person standing in a fume hood with an open beaker, a bunch of mixed acids, and he's stewing it up on a hot plate and he's worried about contamination, he's worried about dissolution, all of the volume of acids, there's no green chemistry. When microwave ovens were introduced in the mid-1970s, of course, all the cooks were very happy, but that it wasn't until the 1980s when commercial microwave ovens were produced specifically for the laboratory environment. And the combination of a microwave oven with mixed acids was very powerful. And that allowed sample decomposition to take place in a closed vessel using very small amounts of acid in very short time periods. There's a big variety of commercial microwave uh, systems out on the market today. All of them are trying to produce systems with higher and higher temperatures because, of course, the oxidation power of an acid is increased at higher temperature. And if you want a higher temperature, you have to operate at higher pressure. Otherwise, the uh, boiling point will not be suppressed and you'll never reach that temperature. So the samples are all put in some kind of quartz or Teflon vessel. They're enclosed in some kind of polymeric body which provides an explosion resistant or explosion proof uh, covering. And they're put in the microwave oven and their, their pressures and temperatures can be averaged or independently measured in each vessel. Some uh, systems allow for up to many individual microwave cavities in a single instrument, each sample then being individually programmed for the type of microwave uh, digestion procedure applied. Some of them operate at atmospheric pressure, accommodating very large masses of material. Uh, pro probably the, uh, the mother of them all, which Professor Nebrega has characterized here, is produced by Milestone. It's actually an autoclave. It operates at up to 3,000 pounds per square inch, 200 bars of pressure, 280 degrees, Samples are loaded in open vessels on a carousel, put into the, uh, the reaction chamber here or the autoclave. It's closed. It's backfilled with a 200 bar pressure of an inert gas. The microwave power is applied. The digestion occurs. Because of the density of the gas here, there's no diffusion, basically, of, of one sample to another, even though these vessels are open. And then the system is cooled, they're pulled out. So up to, up to 40 samples per, per batch. And the digestions, as, as he has found for organic material, can be performed with um, even dilute nitric acid. Two molar nitric acid is now enough to put organic matrices uh, into solution. Another milestone occurred a few years uh, later when someone recognized that a microwave oven could be combined with the advantages of the system of the a conventional par oxygen bomb to give microwave induced combustion. And that was none other than our, our Brazilian here, Erico Flores and Gunter Knapp in Germany. And this uh, microwave induced combustion um, basically involved the use of a, a, a quartz vessel placed inside a Teflon liner. And in this quartz vessel, the sample would be pelletized and sit on a small uh, platform up, up above uh, absorber solutions or dilute nitric or, or even alkaline media. 
A small filter paper would be here, which would be charged with a little bit of uh, ammonium nitrate. The system would be closed. Uh, through this vent, 20 bars of oxygen would be introduced. The system would be put into the microwave oven. And when the microwave power was applied, the ammonium nitrate would initiate an almost explosive combustion of the sample in the overlying atmosphere of oxygen. Following the burning process, a conventional microwave uh, program would start a, a digestion of, or dissolution of the residue with the mixed acids. And no consideration, I think, of sample preparation would be complete without mentioning uh, FIAS, or flow injection for sample processing. In a FIAS system, you can have inline or online um, uh, or even offline sample processing. To achieve such things as pre-concentration using uh, a variety of, of uh, precipitations or solvent extractions or solid phase extractions that will give you uh, matrix separation at the same time. You can have enhanced throughput because this is a continuous flow system. You can even do derivatizations such as vapor generation online. What the FIA system does is work with small sample volumes, enhance sample throughput, increases the repeatability of operations and therefore enhances the precision of the results, eliminates the need for a clean room. This can be done in a dirty laboratory because the sample is never exposed to the atmosphere. So very, very powerful technique. Uh, and this is reviewed by Hansen in 2013, so it's relatively recent. I'd like to now turn lastly to sample introduction. With the ICP, it's clearly evident if you think for a moment, all samples have to be introduced in the form of an aerosol, uh, with the exception of direct sample insertion techniques. And this is where a solid sample is pushed up the throat of the ICP until it gets into the uh, induction region and then it's ablated away. So we have to do, introduce a, a, an aerosol of fine liquid droplets, an aerosol of fine solid particles, or introduce a vapor, because the aerosol properties influence the physical and thermal characteristics of the plasma, and these will influence the sensitivity, the precision, the noise, the limit of detection, and even interference effects. Mostly, samples are introduced by pneumatic nebulization. So we have many, many different nebulizers. This is an example of a, a concentric nebulizer. And the nebulizers themselves are interfaced to different momentum separators or spray chambers. In addition to pneumatic nebulizers, there's also ultrasonic, thermal spray, direct, blah, blah, blah. Even laser ablation and electrothermal vaporization, vaporization can be connected to the ICP. But that's aerosolization. And we will show that uh, the introduction efficiency of aerosols is typically very poor. Even with an electrothermal vaporizer, a spark ablator, or a laser ablation, sample introduction efficiency of those aerosols is typically limited to 20 to 80%. With a conventional liquid pneumatic nebulizer, typically only 2 to 5%. But if we introduce a vapor, we can potentially introduce 100%. And so this is a slide that uh, John Olisic has, has given to me. Even in a, a starvation mode where you're introducing to these pneumatic nebulizers only 10 microliters a minute, the maximum transport efficiency is only about 60%. By the time you get down to where we typically operate these nebulizers, a one milliliter per minute, we are at that old fashioned two to 5% introduction efficiency. If we have an efficient vapor generation system operating at 100% derivatization, even at five milliliters per minute, there's a possibility of increasing the flux of the analyte to the ICP by up to 500 times. Modes of chemical vapor generation, modes of vapor generation themselves include this variety here, many of you may be familiar with classical chemical vapor generation, an example of which is hydride generation, another example, forming volatile chelates, electrochemical, sonochemical, thermochemical, some small amount of research done here.